Good morning. Today is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It's good to know that God has brought us this far already this morning. And he continues to have good things for us as we go through our lives. So let's just lift him up this morning. Give him the glory for the things that happen. In Jesus' name. Let's, let's sing it. Him bow at our feet to do what we want. 
So whatever it is in your life, whether it be circumstances or difficulties or just choices you have to make or whatever, put those at God's feet. Let him be the leader in that. And let's just worship him with our lives, not just our voices this morning. That the things of our heart would get put back into place. That the things he's called us to, no matter how challenging we see before us, that we would take that next step and just follow him. Let's choose to worship this morning. Bye. 
Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts today, that we could hear from you, that we would hear your truth, that we would understand it. Lord, you say that your sheep hear your voice and they follow. Pray that we would hear this morning, that we would follow you. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to be here in this country, in this place, to have such freedom to worship you, to lift you up, and to learn from you. We just thank you for the opportunity you've given us this morning. Pray that you make the most of it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, there we go. 
No one like Jesus. This series we've been on, Encounters with Jesus, we see that when people meet him, their lives are literally transformed. And we'll certainly see one of those today as well. Okay, I'd like to start off with a little quiz, okay? See how well you adults remember your childhood if you happen to go to Sunday school. And kids, you can even enter into this one too, okay? I'm going to... Uh, there are some tremendous truths that are taught in children's Sunday school songs, aren't there? And so let me just review a couple of them. I'm going to kind of start it off and you finish the line. You don't have to finish the whole song. We're not going to finish the whole song, but, but at least finish the line, okay? We'll start off with a nice, easy one, okay? Jesus loves me. There we go. Hey, you guys are doing good. Great. Okay, this little light of mine, I'm going to... Good deal. Okay, now this was my favorite one when I was a ju in junior, a junior in, not junior high, junior. <laughs> I may never march in the infantry, I may or ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery, I may never ride or, over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. In the Lord's army. I just loved all those motions, you know. Phew. Okay. Now, some songs that they teach kind of uh, affirm some truths about some Bible heroes, and those are good, too. Uh, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. Only a boy named David, only a... Oh, I got you on one, didn't I, huh? Only a boy named David, only a little sling. You remember that now? Don't ask me to finish it, but... <laughs> Okay, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. That's right, stand alone. And here's what I'm sure you all remember. Zacchaeus was a... That's right. And we're going to talk about that wee little man today, Zacchaeus. Uh, Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. You can turn there with me. And his story is found in verses 1 through 10. Yes, I better turn here too. I want to just start off by just reading the story, the whole story, and then we'll go back and discuss it. Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be with the, the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord. Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Luke is the only gospel writer to actually record the story of Zacchaeus. I believe he includes it here as an illustration of Jesus' mission on earth, why he came. But before we get to that, there are some tremendous truths that we can learn from the life of Zacchaeus. So we're going to kind of move our way through uh, the story of Zacchaeus in three different movements, which will lead us then ultimately to the mission of Jesus in verse 10. First of all, Zacchaeus, you notice, took some pretty extreme measures to meet Jesus. Let me set the scene first, okay? Jesus is, is coming from Judea down to Jerusalem, and in order to do so, he passes through Jericho. He had just healed a blind man named Bartimaeus in Jericho, the end of chapter 18, and, and now he, he, he and his entourage, whoever's with him, are, are continuing to travel on. And Zacchaeus wants to see him. The city of Jericho. The ancient historian, descri uh, Josephus, described Jericho as the most fruitful country in Judea. With palm trees and balsam trees and honeybees and, and just lots of different fruit and vegetation. 
Jericho is also located pretty close uh, to the Dead Sea, which people love to come visit for medicinal purposes. And uh, it was also located on one of the busiest trade routes in the ancient world with connections to Egypt and the important coastal cities in, in Israel. And so its location combined with a relatively temperate climate made Jericho an ideal retreat location for, for royals and for the wealthy. Some even built elaborate homes and palaces in Jericho, complete with swimming pools and gardens and bathhouses and theaters. And so Jericho, as a city, was a city of, of means, a city of wealth. And wherever you find vast amounts of wealth and powerful people, you will find a great source of taxes, taxation for the Roman Empire. In fact, Jericho was one of three tax centers for the, for the Roman Empire in the entire uh, land of Palestine. And so Zacchaeus is a tax collector. As a tax collector, he would have power over the daily lives of ordinary people in the city. And he would also enjoy direct access to, um, to the powerful people in the Roman Empire. He probably dined with Roman dignitaries on a fairly regular basis, in fact. But you notice Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. He oversaw all the taxation in the entire district. All the other tax collectors reported to him. And as such, they probably... Uh, gave him a part of their income as well. And so he, he grew to become very wealthy. The text even says he was wealthy. He was rich, incredibly rich. In today's world, oh, but as a tax collector, uh, with Rome, working for the Roman Empire, uh, he was actually not well liked by his own people. Tax collectors were known to abuse their power, the power of their office, and, and charge even more than they were supposed to, and then pocket the rest, you know, kind of line their pockets with, uh, with the balance. And so while they are powerful, while they're very wealthy, they are also despised and hated by their own people. They were considered traitors to the nation of Israel. Today's world, they would be categorized alongside people like mob leaders and drug dealers and so forth. And so even though Zacchaeus was powerful and wealthy, he knew that there was something missing. And he heard about this Jesus. He may have even heard that Jesus had just healed Bartimaeus uh, in Jericho. And so when he heard that Jesus was in town, he wanted to see him. Verse 3 says he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. The word short is the word micro in the Greek. It comes from the word micro, which means small or little. In other words, Zacchaeus was vertically challenged. We don't know exactly how tall he was, but probably, I read somewhere that he was probably, given the height of other people in that time, probably under five feet tall. So he's, he's pretty short. Can't you just picture Zacchaeus, you know, kind of standing on his tiptoes, trying to look over the crowd. You know, he gets up there as high as he can. He can't do that, so he tries to look in between people to see him, and none, none of that works. And so he's thinking to himself, what can I do? What can I do to see Jesus? Oh, there's a tree up there. And so he ran ahead to this sycamore fig tree. Verse 4 says, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. What is a sycamore fig tree? I'm sure the emphasis is on the word sycamore rather than fig because I've climbed fig trees. And I think Zacchaeus was smarter than that. You don't climb fig trees unless you like itching all over the rest of the day. They're, they're, they're miserable. Um, and so this is what this is. This is a tree that looks kind of like a mulberry tree, like the one we have in between the, the offices and the, and the fellowship hall. So it looked very much like that. The leaves were like mulberry leaves, but it also had a, a fig-like fruit on it. And so, you know, you know, that is a great climbing tree, right? Just ask our kids. Don't you like to climb on that mulberry tree? And, you know, even, even Mozart, the kids like to do that. I'd sit in my office, and in, in their breaks, they all come out and 
someone's climbing a tree. And so Zacchaeus, he must have been a good tree climber himself. And so it's plenty tall enough to get above the crowd and be able to get a good look at Jesus. The point here is that Zacchaeus went to extreme measures to see Jesus. He wasn't satisfied with just a glimpse from behind the crowd. He wanted to see him clearly, get a good view of him. And so he, he would not let anything get in his way, not the crowd, not his wealth, not his reputation, nor even his physical stature. If only there were people like that today. If only that were true of people today, I should say. Today, instead of doing everything possible to see Jesus, to meet him and worship him on Sundays, people tend to come up with all kinds of excuses to skip seeing Jesus and meeting him on Sundays. And I got housework to do. We're going to go off to the lake or the forest today, to the mountains. Now, I understand that, that this coronavirus certainly is forcing many people to stay home from church on Sundays, and that's understandable, certainly is. But normally, are you excited for Sundays? Do you look forward to Sundays, to, to a, a chance to just come and, and worship the Lord and, he, and hear from God's Word and, and just meet Jesus on Sabbath? Will you go to extreme measures to see Him? Do you do everything in your power to take Sundays off so you can be with God's family, meeting Jesus, worshiping Him? Or are you quick to come up with convenient excuses to skip Jesus, to do something else? Zacchaeus took extreme measures. He wasn't going to let anything stand in his way to get a glimpse of Jesus. The second thing we see in Verses 5 through 7, as Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus to his home. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I, I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. And, and so you just kind of get the picture. When Jesus reaches uh, the tree, he looks up and he sees a guy up there. And he'd been through Jericho before. You know, he traveled between Judea and and uh, Galilee several times, so he probably knew who Zacchaeus was. And he looks up there and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I want to have dinner at your house tonight. In fact, I want to spend the night tonight at your house. Now, in our Western culture, that would probably be considered kind of poor etiquette. Perhaps even rude to invite yourself over to another person's home for dinner or to spend the night. But in ancient Middle Eastern culture, it was considered a privilege to provide food and shelter and protection and rest for travelers. They were extremely hospitable. In fact, many homes in those days would have a, 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 almost a guest room and, and welcome um, visitors, travelers, per, especially if they were people uh, of dignitaries or people of high social rank. It would be considered an honor. Every Jew in Jericho would have welcomed an opportunity to, to have Messiah, to host a Messiah on his journey through Jericho. But to everyone's surprise, Jesus chose to give that honor to the city's most notorious sinner, the tax collector. Verse 6 says, tells us uh, Zacchaeus' response, so he came down at once and welcomed him. He hurried down the tree as fast as he possibly could and excitedly welcomed Jesus to his home. And let's put this in perspective, okay? Jesus staying at Zach's home, we'll call him Zach for short, okay? It's like accepting the hospitality of, of Al Capone, an old mafia leader. In fact, you notice in verse 7, the crowd themselves were shocked they muttered amongst themselves, he's, he's going to the home of a, of a sinner for dinner. Now, you need to know, this isn't the first tax collector Jesus befriended, is it? In fact, one of Jesus' disciples was a tax collector. 
Levi. We know him as Matthew, the writer of the first gospel. And this isn't the first time Jesus was accused of dining with sinners either. When he called Matthew, he went to Matthew's home and had dinner in Ma at Matthew's home. And, and Matthew's home was filled with, with his friends. More sinners, more tax collectors. And the Pharisees accused Jesus at that time of being a friend of tax collectors and sinners. To which Jesus responded, it is not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Zacchaeus welcomed him to his home. To his oikos. We are not told who all was in Zacchaeus' home while he hosted Jesus, but I suspect it was much like Levi's home. The word for house is the word oikos. That sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? Here is a reference to Zach's house, but it probably included his household, his oikos, his, the people in his life as well. In fact, when Jesus responds later, he says salvation has come to this household, to, his, to this oikos. And so I suspect his wife was there, probably fixing the dinner and hosting, and his kids were probably there if he had kids, or maybe his parents. They probably even invited a few other tax collectors to join him, maybe even some Roman dignitaries. We don't know who all was there, but there were, it was probably a pretty full house of people. How are we doing these days at introducing Jesus to our household, to our oikos? You know, during this pandemic, there's a lot of fear in the world, isn't there? A lot of people are scared, afraid. What's next? A lot of anger as well. We see that in the riots and the protests these days. As Christians, we have the answer to the fear. We have the answer to the anger. We have the answer to everything in life because the answer is Jesus. Are we telling our oikos? Are we telling people in the community about Jesus? Well, Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus into his home. Third, Zacchaeus made amends to those he wronged. There's definitely a, a gap of time between verse 7 and verse 8. Jesus is now in Zacchaeus' home, verse 8. <clears throat> so in verses 8 and 9, uh, we read, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and I have... And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. So while the people are all complaining that Jesus is dining with sinners, Jesus dines with a sinner, notorious one, Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus is literally transformed, changed because of Jesus. And at some point during the evening, during the dinner, maybe after dinner, Zacchaeus stands up and announces he's going to make amends to the people that he has wronged in the past. Verse 8 says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. I want you to notice a couple things first. First of all, notice that Zacchaeus acknowledges Jesus as Lord. Uh, he's the chief tax collector, so he knows what it means to be the boss, to be over other people, right? So now he's acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. He didn't call him Jesus. He referred to him as Lord, master, ruler of his life, which led him to repent then of his sinfulness. And he did two things. His repentance led to two different activities. Actions. First of all, he gave half of his possessions to the poor. I suspect he'd probably not been too kind to poor people in the past. You know, if they owed taxes, he could have shown mercy, but no, not a tax collector. Probably wouldn't show much mercy. Probably demanded that they pay anyway. In fact, some of the taxation may have even led to some of the poverty. But Zacchaeus had a change of heart after meeting Jesus. 
And his heart is filled with gratitude to the Lord, and his heart is filled with compassion for the poor. So he pledges half of all his possessions to the poor, a tremendous sum of money, as he was quite wealthy. But then secondly, he repaid those that he had cheated or defrauded. If I've cheated anyone. Now, as I've mentioned in the past, the Greeks have various ways to express conditional clauses. And this is what, what we call a, a first-class conditional clause, which assumes the condition to be true. In other words, literally it would say, if I have cheated anyone, which I certainly have, I will repay them. I'll repay them. And he's not just going to repay what he cheated them from. He's going to repay them four times. As a tax collector, he probably had very good records as well of everybody he taxed and how much and so forth. So he could easily determine whom he had cheated and how much he had cheated them or overcharged them. And so he promises here to make amends, to make things right. Not just to repay what he stole, but to repay four times what he stole. This story of Zacchaeus in the Gospel of Luke I think is placed here very specifically for a reason. It stands in stark contrast to the story of the rich young ruler just the chapter before in chapter 18. When this rich young ruler approached Jesus, Jesus told him to sell his possessions and give to the poor. And rather than doing so, he was saddened and he walked away from the Lord. But Zacchaeus, when he met Jesus, he was convicted and he made amends to those he cheated, and he gave half of his wealth to the poor. Quite a contrast. Now let me clarify something really quick. Zacchaeus' actions did not save him. Rather, he committed his life to Jesus, and Jesus changed his heart, and then he made amends to those he had wronged. A couple things to point out to, to indicate that. Verse 8, remember we said Zacchaeus first said, Lord. He acknowledged who he was. He's the Lord. And then he made amends. Verse 9, Jesus proclaimed salvation has come to this household. We're not saved by our works. But our works do flow from our salvation out of a transformed heart. And that's what we see with Zacchaeus. May I get personal for a moment? I think there's some tremendous truths to learn from Zacchaeus. We've already looked at a couple of them, but here's another one. There's some people in your life, some people perhaps in your past that you've wronged, that you've cheated in one way or another, or there's some wrongs that you need to make right. Do you need to make amends to someone in your life? And when I say make amends, I'm not necessarily talking about financial, uh, repaying four times the finances, but maybe just a simple I'm sorry, or I was wrong, or please forgive me. Are there some broken relationships that need to be mended? Think about it. As God's children, we have experienced God's grace in our hearts and lives, haven't we? So we are then to extend grace to those in our lives as well. Even to those who have hurt us or to those that we've hurt. As Zacchaeus did, we too need to make amends to people that we've hurt. And so we see that Zacchaeus took extreme measures to see Jesus. He welcomed Jesus into his home. He introduced Jesus to his oikos. He made amends to those he wronged. Carl Swindoll kind of sums up Zach's story quite well. He writes this, Despite his immense wealth, impressive power, and sordid past, Zacchaeus compared everything he had gained to the kingdom of God and came to an easy decision. He cast it all aside for the sake of becoming a follower of Jesus. And I would suggest to you that Luke includes the story of Zacchaeus to illustrate for us the mission of Jesus. That brings us to verse 10. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. What is Jesus' mission? To seek and to save the lost. He came to save sinners like Levi, like Zacchaeus. That's why Jesus left his throne in heaven and was born in a manger. To seek and to save the lost. We like to use big theological words, you know. He, he came to redeem sinners. He came to reconcile man to God. We like to talk about election and atonement and justification. And hey, those are all great terms, rich in meaning. But Luke sums it up very simply. Jesus' mission is simply to seek and to save the lost. That's why Jesus spent three years pouring his life into 12 guys that, he calls, that we call disciples and training them. Why? So that they can go out and seek and save the lost. That's why Jesus suffered and died on a cruel cross to seek and to save the lost. And that's still the mission of his body, the church today, to seek and to save the lost. It's easy for us in churches to get sidetracked by many, many different things in life. By pandemics, by politics, by protests, by riots. And, and, and we get so enamored with everything that's going on that we just lose sight of our mission to seek and to save the lost. We get distracted in the church by, by buildings and programs and ministries and budgets and all the, the trappings of worldly success. Or maybe we get distracted by prophecy and world events, you know, with all this stuff going on in the world. Everybody's asking, is Jesus coming back soon? And so it's easy to get distracted from the mission to seek and to save the lost. That's Jesus' mission. That's the mission of the church today. Last week we talked about the one thing. You remember the one thing? Knowing and loving God. Knowing and loving Jesus Christ. But out of that knowing him and loving him, certainly we want to share him with others so they too can experience the transformation that Jesus brings to know him and love him as well. Who are the Zacchaeuses in your life? What are you doing to reach out to share Jesus with your oikos? Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for your word. Lord, the story of Zacchaeus, there's so many great truths there to learn and apply to our lives. I pray that we would do just that. Or that we might think about it. If there's anybody in our lives that we need to make amends to, we need to go and say, I'm sorry to. But Lord, even more than that, that we would just be reminded of our mission, your mission, to seek and to save the lost, that we too would just be involved in that and, and share Jesus with the Zacchaeuses in our lives, the people around us who don't know you as Savior. Lord, challenge us, encourage us. Just give us your courage to share you with other people. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Christ's midst, go with the Lord.